has been your best success story in, fire, in a fire effects monitoring project? We had in 2002 the Rodeo Chetuskai fire in Arizona. One of, well, probably the largest fire, wildfire, recorded in Arizona history. And um, we were asked, myself and my crew, w were asked to help in monitoring the immediate post-fire effects. And I was very um, happy with the crew's response and the fact that our protocols were able to respond to what they wanted us to do. We took the protocols that we normally use and just massaged them a little bit and said, well, these are our, um, this is what the immediate post-fire effects look like. And what they were really concerned with was looking at areas that had been treated for fuels mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. areas that hadn't. But you could actually see, it was incredible, the difference you could see whether the area had been, to use an overused term, nuked on one side of the road and then on the other side of the road where it had been treated mm -hmm. previously, several years even there were green trees still there. I guess one of the most successful projects I've had recently with my crew is a mechanical treatment monitoring project that we just started this year and it's a new protocol with new objectives and the crew and I sat down together to discuss why we were monitoring this project, what our objectives were and what the best methodology would be to monitor them and we looked at the literature and they, the crew, was involved in deciding how to monitor. And we have the latitude to do that because it's a new protocol and because mechanical treatment monitoring is new for us. And with that level of involvement, those employees, not only did they come up with a great methodology for monitoring, but they really dove into it and did an outstanding job. And um, their creativity and, and good quality of work really paid off for us. Alrighty, the next question is, what fire effects monitoring assignment had the biggest surprise for you? Two years ago at Grand Canyon we had the uh, Swamp Ridge complex of mainly fire use fires and in that we had 18 of our FMH plots that just happened to burn by sheer chance. Um, so it gave us a, you know, something great to be able to assess the effects of these fire use fires when normally we don't have anything set up in advance of them. Um, and one of the most surprising things about it was that with these 18 plots and you know a wide variety of fire behaviors, immediately post burn there wasn't a single tree, overstory tree, that we said had died. Now we normally wait until five years out to assess that, but you know people want to know how many trees died, how many trees died. We said, well, at least on these 18 plots, immediately after the fire, we wouldn't say any of them had died yet, which was pretty darn surprising, and I think was a really good indicator of how well fire use can behave if you know all the management proper management practices are taken and it's you know being allowed to burn at the right time. The prescribed burn that we had right outside of Moab the surprising thing was is the amount of, of birds wild turkey and, and elk that actually came into the site no more than about three weeks after the burn. All right now thinking of one of your recent fire effects monitoring projects and it could be in the last you know, a few years or, or so. What, um, what did you learn from that project that you think others might benefit from? But I'm constantly surprised, and this is certainly important, about how our data uh, may be used mm -hmm. once they leave our control. Right. And uh, I know Diane mentioned how important it is for the crew to be professional and, and involved in what they're doing. And also, we need to follow up in that manner with the way our data mm -hmm. are used. I found, that, I found that it's important to be real clear what the objectives are for the monitoring because a lot of people just say just go monitor mm -hmm. but without knowing exactly what the question is you don't know how to design the plots or how many to put in or where to put them. Yeah, we really have to work with managers to convince them that you can't monitor unless you have objectives mm -hmm. and they'll come up with an objective like we want to return the natural um, fire behavior to the landscape. We want to reintroduce fire. And that's a goal. And that is not measurable. <laughs> yeah, it's not a measurable. Um, exactly, right? And you can't monitor a, a goal. You can't monitor a concept. And so there is a lot of give and take with those managers trying to articulate an objective that can be measured. One thing that I've found helpful in getting those specific objectives is looking at the burn plan because it'll have things like we want 10% tree mortality mm -hmm. and that's something you can measure mm -hmm. and it, you know, it's there. I think something on more of a 
<clears throat> not project specific basis, but that I've learned in the time that I've been in this job is that as far as seasonal employees go, sometimes they'll only grow if you really allow them to. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I don't know, I guess I've been getting less controlling <laughs> as the years go by and trying to, you know, give more work opportunities and more decision making yeah. ability to, to <coughs> the seasonals. And, uh, you know, I've just been really impressed with the results realize that yeah maybe they don't always do everything quite to the standards that I would hope but they come up with some things you know that I never think of but the other thing is if you are gonna you know be giving them more leeway be ready to give both positive and negative feedback because they need to you know be able to grow and learn too, not just get the chance for freedom and then not hear anything yeah. back we do need to link the you know the practical and the and the and the data you know what's it saying Obviously, we are collecting a lot of information that, that can be very, very useful. But what has worked is a you know, one or two page lesson learned on a particular project that, you know, okay, you're 90% complete or done with implementing the project. The line officers love seeing that kind of information. You know, the fire management officers, burn boss. You know, what actually worked and what, 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 can, we, what can we improve on? And make it more of a, of a learning environment rather than a, you know, defensive, you know, environment. Two years ago at Grand Canyon, um, yeah, um, we did our first prescribed burn since um, before Cerro Grande, mm -hmm. and everyone was itching to finally get fire on the ground. And I mean, honestly, looking at it in advance, everyone knew it was kind of on the wet side of things. It was late in the season, it was late October, and it, we kind of started and then it rained, and then we waited a couple weeks, it kind of dried out. And then it was November, and like, well, maybe it's dry enough. Went ahead with the burn and really did a a big air show and burned more than we originally sort of planned about was still within you know the parameters and you know then we we're done we're like hey good job we finally pulled it off you know we got 3,000 acres done well we went out and read the plots and uh, even just you know going to the plots you could see that <laughs> it was really really cold burn I mean there were enormous patches of unburned fuel and then we got the data and you know kind of gave them some feedback and said hey you know, it was great, and I understand the pressure to get the fire on the ground and do this, but, it, you know, we, if we keep burning this late in the season, we are not going to be meeting our objectives. And they don't, you know, they don't want to hear that. They're under different pressures, you know, than we are as the monitors. But, you know, you still have to give that feedback. Yeah. That pre-burn briefing the morning of the first ignition is really important because that's when you can tell everyone who's going to have a drip torch in their hand what the objectives of the project are and what to target with their drip torch and maybe what to not burn, even though it'll make a big, cool looking flame. We don't want to burn the cottonwood trees, so ignite over in these kinds of vegetation instead. And I, I think that really helps a great deal if the, if the burn boss pushes it pretty hard to everyone on the, on the burn. On some of your recent fire effects projects, Describe some of the best crew work that you've uh, you've been with your crew, and why did it work so well? We've got at Grand Canyon um, a couple of plots that are, or a couple of groups of plots that are arranged such that it really makes sense to do about three of them in a day. And in the past, I've pretty much just told people, okay, we're going out, we're doing three, you know. And by the end of the day, they're pretty much shot. <laughs> this year, though, our schedule hadn't been as rigorous and I didn't feel like I had to force people to attempt the trifecta as we called it on each of these <laughs> on these two sets of plots and we did the first two and it was getting late in the day and we were not going to finish the third one before you know the end of the day we couldn't walk out back to our vehicle and such and get home before you know close business and I honestly didn't think anyone would want to do them and before like I said I'd always made people do them and both times this came up the crew said, that's okay, we don't care if it takes longer, you know, whatever, let's, let's get them done, we're out here. And I guess it surprised me a bit. The fact that both instances they chose to do this um, really impressed me. Uh, you know, we work in a fire organization and it's a pretty <coughs> rules and regulation, militaristic style in some cases, but our employees are botanists. They're yeah. natural resources people and they don't respond well to to military discipline and you know severe rules and regulations they they 
they just are a, a different <laughs> breed and I'm glad you guys said that because I've <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been in the exact same boat and uh, really this last year I changed my hiring practices a bit to intentionally hire the best crew dynamic rather than to hire the most efficient crew. Oh. I'd always hired before this year I'd always tried to hire people who seemed to be the most qualified had the best skill set and would really just be able to bang out the plots. And we had heavier plot workloads in previous years too. So in a way it was good, but we also had poor crew dynamics. But this last year, I intentionally hired people who were maybe less experienced, who I, I don't know, I just got the impression through interviews and such that they would be a better crew person. Mm -hmm. I didn't hire individuals so much as I was trying to hire a team. And we also had less of a intensive plot workload, so that of course helped <laughs> in that strategizing. But I just got lucky because it worked out great. What was the most significant thing you learned on, of any of the prescribed fire fires that um, were successful? After a prescribed fire, about a year after, we found that the fuel loading was actually higher than it had been because of the scorching and all the needles and branches falling down. And so the fire guys realized that multiple entries are going to be necessary, that you can't do it all just in one. Mm -hmm. and, and so the data fed back into the burn plan. There's one that I wasn't necessarily involved in, but I looked at some data on when I used to work at uh, Lassa Volcanic National Park in California, and <clears throat> I did sort of an informal study of, you know, how effective their prescribed burns were in relation to their <clears throat> fire effects data and also, you know, their fuel moistures and prescriptive parameters. And one thing that I found is that very few of their burns really were meeting objectives. They're generally too cool. The one that definitely did also had the most spots and was the greatest hazard to the people there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's really kind of empirical data, but I'd say based on my experience with a lot of other burns, you know, if, if a lot of objectives are based on, it seems like if you're going to meet them, you have to burn a little bit hotter than a lot of managers are willing to burn. Okay, how about the last question then? Um, what's the most significant thing you learned on, on prescribed fire you were involved in that went out of prescription. I'm thinking of a couple of prescribed fires that got away that I've looked at and no structures were threatened. Um, some, the boundary was breached but otherwise no humans or life or property were threatened but I have to say that those were the best um, resource burns I have ever seen when the, the prescription Maybe the weather changed and, and the fire behavior increased to the point where it crossed the burn boundary and went up the hill. That hill looks great. And the outlet fire from 2000, um, I think I wasn't actually there when the outlet fire happened. Um, and that's def that one definitely was a prescribed fire. That got away. Um, <clears throat> and the two things that I think we can really learn from that, the first is that, you know, it nuked <laughs> a lot of mixed conifer type habitat on the North Rim and people were of course you know bemoaning the loss of all of that um, after it happened. Well it didn't take long in fact less than two months after the burn um, the aspen regeneration in those areas was out it was incredible <laughs> beyond belief and I don't think anyone necessarily anticipated that it wasn't you know I mean we know that aspen's a you know, early successional species, and it would respond probably well, but I think everyone was probably a little bit shocked about how well it responded. One of our objectives on a prescribed burn was just a broadcast burn and um, ponderous pine to reduce some of the understory. And we had, all, it was uh, rimmed by gamble oak and, and aspen, and it was a late season prescribed burn, and um, my instructions to the crew were to black line the unit and run it right into the the gamble oak and aspen is a natural, you know, barrier to, you know, containing the, the fire. Well, we all woke up the next morning and there was, you know, fire off the rim, you know, down off this one edge. And um, it just did not occur to me until we all looked at it that um, it was late season aspen that had had six weeks to dry with, you know, the leaves were off. And so it kind of crept its way down the, the bottom of the hill and it was definitely unsafe to put anybody in there to you know, cut it off because there was just too many snags. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to either any of the questions or anything?